If I've learned one thing in three and a half seasons of recording this show and is talking to experts across all kinds of safety disciplines, is that paying attention is one of the most important skills that we can develop in our roles as protective parents. Gary Quesenberry spent his career paying attention in situations where not paying attention could get him hurt or killed or other people around him hurt or killed. He's released in a trilogy of books, two of which are out now, about how we can apply what he learned to civilian life and to our responsibilities as parents. Thank you, Gary, for coming on today. Thank you all for watching. If you get the chance, please do hit the like and the subscribe button below. It helps more than you know. And if you really like what you're doing, come over to Patreon where you can support us. Thank you again, everybody. Let's get to work. Welcome back, everybody, to Safest Family on the Block, where knowledge is power. I'm your host, Jason, and joining me today is Gary Questenberry. Hello, Gary. Hey, how's it going? So far, so good. How about your own self? Oh, it's going great, man. Got some nice weather finally, getting outside doing a little yard work. I apologize for grass in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Gary, I'm really happy to have you here. Gary was born in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. His love of the outdoors and patriotic spirit led him to enlist in the U.S. Army, where he served as an artilleryman during Operation Desert Storm. Gary later became a career federal air marshal and instructor where he devoted his life to studying the areas of violence and predatory behavior. Now Gary works as a personal defense trainer and has developed numerous basic and advanced level training courses focused on mental toughness, marksmanship, and defensive tactics. Gary is also the author of Spotting Danger Before It Spots You and the upcoming Spotting Danger Before It Spots Your Kids, plus a couple other books in that series that we will talk about before this show is over, where he teaches situational awareness to keep children safe. He's a competitive pistol shooter featured on the History Channel's hit television series, Top Shot Season 3 and Top Shot All-Stars. He has an extensive background in domestic and foreign counter-terror training and has worked in both the private and corporate sectors to help educate others on the importance of situational awareness and personal safety. So that's a resume. <laughs> Thank you very much for your service across all the various channels. And what I loved about this book and we were talking about it before we went on the air, was that this approach, this uh, emphasis on spotting danger before it spots you, on situational awareness as an important part of self-defense. I feel like so many self-defense products are out there. They focus on the combatives of it because, you know, that's what we buy movie tickets for. That's what sells. That's what uh, people are most viscerally afraid of. But just the good sense of not being a target because you're, seem aware so the bad guys aren't going to target you and also you're aware enough to get out of the way if the bad guys are coming that's a much higher percentage of success yeah absolutely i tell people all the time you know the best way to keep yourself safe 100 percent of the time is you know not to lock yourself up in your house and just stay away from everybody in general but to be able to see something going bad identify it ahead of time to give yourself the space you need to just get around it or just avoid it all together so, you know, that's uh, I, I worked for a number of years in the prison system. And that's one of the first things that I learned from some of my old mentors was, you know, I had an old guy who used to tell me all the time that you go home every night because they let you. That's the only way, you know, and if you're not aware of your surroundings or you're just walking around kind of oblivious to the little indicators that 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 keys you in on the fact that something is wrong, then it makes for a really rough night. <laughs> That's a situation where I don't care how bad of an ass you are, you are unarmed and outnumbered by a factor of dozens to one, even a hundred to one. 129 to one. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. And so you've got to have, you got to have that radar up. And yeah. it also, it extends beyond violence and crime as well, where what was the last time you tripped and hurt yourself? It wasn't because you were paying attention. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Or exactly. even we going wider out into, you know, the, the big killers of men our age, it's, it's not a bad guy that's going to get us, it's a heart attack. So right. how much attention are we paying to our diet to yeah. getting the road work in and staying healthy? Yeah. Yeah, it's all, you know, I mean, situational awareness extends to all parts of your life, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's just a matter of paying attention to the little things. 
learning, learning what's normal, whether that be, you know, when you walk out your door in the morning, going to work, or you're going through the parking lot at the mall, you know, what's the normal behaviors? We call those the baseline yeah. behaviors. And then being able to find the little things that rise above those baselines that, that, you know, indicate danger. And, you know, that works in your personal life too. You know, I mean, you know, you know, good and well, I, I, you know, my wife and I, we've raised three kids. They're all adults now, but when they were teenagers and they were all in the house together, we would go shopping or go out for a dinner or something like that. And we'd come home. And if something was wrong, you knew, you just knew something went wrong when you were gone, even though they're not fessing up to it, you get that feeling, you know, there's certain little environmental indicators that are keying you into the fact that something's wrong. And maybe you can't put your finger on it right now, but you kind of figure it out. You realize that those, you know, those, that intuition that you had was correct. And that works, you know, whether you're talking about raising kids or whether you're talking about trying to keep yourself safe walking down the street. Absolutely that. It's kind of got a little vibe to it, but it's real. You know, you pick up on those little things. Sure. And then you, then you chase them down. You get curious. Yeah. And find out what's going on you know like you said you come home you left the teenagers at home and the house felt one way you go out you have a good time you come back and it's just maybe it's a little too quiet maybe it's a little too noisy yeah. maybe yeah and then oh i need to pay attention right you know, what's yeah. the old saying yeah. bad stuff happens when you've been napping <laughs> yeah <laughs> right right yeah. yeah but you know i tell people all the time that baseline you know you got to look at it as kind of a uh yeah a variance in behaviors mm -hmm. you know you've got a you've got a, a it's a line but it's a thin line and mm -hmm. typical behaviors can vary up or down within that baseline mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but there are certain things that are going to key you in right away to the fact that this is out of place you know and in the book i use the example of you know you're at a beach and you know at a beach you kind of have a an idea in your mind of how people dress how people are acting you know, what that looks and feels like. But, you know, if you see someone walking down the beach alone, everybody else is, you know, in bathing suits or whatever, playing with their kids. And this, you know, some guy comes walking down the beach wearing a heavy parka with his hand shoved in his pocket and he's not making eye contact, but he's moving like he's got a, per you know, something's just off about that. There's, you know, there's something that doesn't fit. And that's, you know, that's kind of a easy example to sit in front of people and say, you see the difference? But, you know, the more you do it, the more you can key yourself into the little things, mm -hmm. you know, that other people may not necessarily pick up on right away. But, you know, it's a process. And I outline the process in the book. You know, you got to understand, you know, how to build this. It's not just something that you, you know, you know, just, yeah. just, just pick up like in an instant and then walk away with it. Be like, OK, got it. I'm going to be safe now for the rest of my life. It's just not how it works. You know, it's, it's a lifestyle. Exactly. One of the things I appreciate about your book, the way you present this information, is you make it clear that nobody is going to learn a new skill here. What they're going to do is apply things that we do every day. When you come home from work, you know if your spouse or partner is in a bad mood. You know that already because you know your spouse's baseline behavior when you get home. Yeah. And you know when they say, oh, it's nothing, whether they mean that it's nothing or whether they mean that you screwed up. You know that. And yeah. so you're taking that same thing that you already apply. You know, you know your boss's moves at work. You know walking into the office, whether or not it's going to be a good day or a bad day, all, usually within the first 10 minutes. And again, like you said, it's not from one particular thing you notice, but just from the aggregate of five or six little things that are different from baseline that tell you, oh, man, everybody's stressed. This is going to be rough. Maybe I should uh, make some kind of client call off-site today. Yeah, right. And it's, you know, these are skills that we all already practice and you show us in a very specific way how to apply that to a security mindset and a safety mindset. Sure. And in the book, you outline kind of three large steps. And the first one is understanding the threat. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the book's broken down into three separate phases. Like you said, the first one is understanding the threat. And what I tell people all the time is, you know, you have to understand how predators think and act so that you can better identify those behaviors that set them apart and the little pre-incident indicators that they give off that 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 shows you something bad is about to happen happen around you so you know 
Ted Bundy once famously said that he could spot his next victim by the tilt of her head, right? So we, as just regular citizens out walking around in public, have to understand what it is that predators look for so that we can change the behaviors in ourselves that make us an appealing target. So right. there was a study back in 1981. There was two sociologists, Grayson and Stein, right? And they did this experiment where they sat cameras up in the middle of Times Square and they filmed people walking back and forth all day. They took that set of videos and they showed them to the inmates uh, at a local prison. And what they did was they told the inmates, we just want you to look at everybody walking by that comes into the frame of the camera and we want you to rate them on a scale of one to 10. So one to three, you, you and I both know, you know, predators are gonna break their targets down into two categories, hard targets and soft targets. Soft targets are people that are easy to approach. They look like they're not paying very much attention. They may be easy to take advantage of. Hard targets, somebody's got their guard up. They look like they know what's going on. Maybe they can take care of themselves. They got a big dog. You know, those are things that make people hard targets. So soft targets were rated from one to three by the inmates. Hard targets were rated seven to 10. And everybody that they picked who rated in that one to three, that soft target category, they all displayed the same types of body language. They didn't make eye contact. They walked with their head down. They were looking for ways to distract themselves. Like for us now, not in 1981, but for now that would be, you know, headphones, iPhone, everybody's just kind of locked into their own little world. And they think that somehow that keeps them, you know, a buffer around them from the bad things going on around them. But anyway, short shuffling, shuffling strides, uh, like I said, an inability to make eye contact, just kind of looking like you don't, have, you're not moving with a purpose. You don't exactly know where you're going. Things like that are the things that they use to rate those people in the videos from one to three. So by knowing that, by knowing what those little things like your stride and the way you swing your arms or the way you hold your head, by knowing that those are the things they key in on and use to, to target you, it's easier for you to change that in yourself. You know, because you can you can easily walk down the street with a friend, you know, and 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 kind of take a look at your friend, take a look at yourself and see exactly what type of posture, body language you're putting out and how others could possibly view that. So and, you know, on the flip side of that, for the hard targets, you know, they took long to medium strides. Uh, their head was up. They weren't afraid to make eye contact and they were moving like they had a purpose. So those are people that they were like, all right, I'm just gonna pass that person on by, find somebody a little bit easier to approach. And that's who I would target as a victim. So knowing those things really kind of opens your world up in terms of understanding situational awareness and how it applies to your personal safety. Well, awareness begins with self-awareness. And here we are again, where you're paying attention to how you behave and what that message that puts out in the world. Right. The other thing about that study that I found very interesting was the people who were rated one to three, were rated one to three by the overwhelming majority of the inmates who participated in the study, yeah. regardless of what their crime was. So right. people with very different victims, very different crimes still said, oh no, those people, those people would be easy to pick off. Sure. And also by, as you say, by the con by contrast, I don't want a truck with those guys, <laughs> right. you know, because yeah. the bad guys are cowards. All predators are cowards, as pretty as lions are, as majestic as they are, they don't want to fight they want an easy meal and human predators are the same way they're if you present as powerful and difficult they're going to go bother somebody else right well you use that lion analogy you know you don't see you yeah. don't see lions taking off after the big bull in a herd you know what i mean uh -uh. they're trying to cut those weak little calves off on the on mm -hmm. the on the fringes of the herd and, and separate them and you know mm -hmm. there's their meal Predators are the same way. We were talking earlier about uh, Rory Miller, you know, another yeah. author who's written several books on violence and how, how, you know, you handle that in your life. But he breaks down predators, and I use this in my book as well, into two categories. you got resource predators and process predators. So, you know, a resource predator is somebody that's just looking at you as a resource. You may have an expensive purse or a watch or something that they're looking at and they're thinking, okay, that's something of value that I want. I could take it. I could flip it for cash. I could sell it to buy drugs or do whatever. I, you know what I mean? That's that's how their mindset works. 
So, you know, that is a resource predator. A process predator, on the other hand, is much different because they're not looking at you for what you have. They get off on the act of violence itself, you know, the process of violence. So, you know, they have two very specific methodologies for how they go about or, or why they do what they do. But the people they pick are the same across the board, like in the Grayson and Science study. You know, they're going to they're going to pick that weak link off that person they consider to be the soft target that they can get away with. Because at the end of the day, like you just said, you know, they're more concerned with their own personal safety and not getting caught than they are about what they can get away with. Absolutely. One of the best ways I heard that express is that a resource predator is after your stuff. A process predator is after you. Yeah. And the uh, the worst case scenario in those two situations, one is much worse than the other. But again, as you say they target the same body language. They look for the same behaviors in us. Right. Because that's, they don't want, like, they don't want to be caught. They don't want to get hurt. They want this to go to the script that they've written in their head ahead of time. Yeah. And anything we can do to indicate that we're not going to play. Right. Reduces their chances of attacking us in the first place. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it's funny, like you mentioned the thing about the script that they've written in their mm -hmm. head. And, and we do that too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not not predators per se, but, you know, just everyday folks walking down the street. There's a script in your head constantly and you could be leaving your office and walking to your car. And, you know, you've done that so many times over the course of the years that there's a script. I'm going to leave point A. I'm going to arrive at point B. It's going to be this time. You know, I'm going to fire the car up, head home. Dinner will be ready, whatever, you know, whatever the story is you're telling yourself. But when that story is interrupted, you know, it triggers that fear response and that adrenaline dump. And unless you're ready for it, you know, you get caught off guard by that. And that, that, that flood of adrenaline, it's happened to me. I mean, anybody that's worked in, you know, military, law enforcement, prisons, you know, you've been caught off guard, I guarantee it. And you've had something happen that, that spikes that adrenaline and you feel those effects and you realize pretty quickly that that's not a position you want to be in. So, by paying closer attention, kind of ignoring that script. And instead of mm -hmm. saying, okay, this is the way it's going to go, you start playing what I call in the book, these little what if games. So what if I'm walking to my car tonight mm -hmm. and this happens, you know, somebody comes out from this dark corner or there's a car parked here beside of me and it's running and there's somebody in there and I don't want to turn my back on all these different scenarios. You know, you play those things in your head to prevent yourself from being reactionary when the time comes. If you can see it coming in advance, everybody says, you know, the action is faster than reaction. Well, I, I kind of argue that point with a lot of people. I've got this little demonstration that I do to kind of prove the fact, but in most cases that's true, but in every case it's unanticipated action that is always faster than reaction. You know, it's unanticipated action. The things that you didn't see coming, those are the things that you have a problem reacting to because your mind kind of freezes up for a minute. And mm -hmm. you've got to kind of roll through that Rolodex of, you know, what I learned in jujitsu class and, you know, what I learned at this last firearms class. And, what, you know, you're going through all these things in your mind that can save you in the moment when, if you could have just seen it coming, you know, 20, 30 more yards away and, and avoided it, you wouldn't be going through that process in the first place. So like we said in the beginning, you know, keeping yourself safe is all about situational awareness. I also want to put in a, the idea about how you have that script in your head. So many people get into trouble when an attacker happens, some kind of situation, whether it's crime, whether it's an accident, where they see the signs coming, but they refuse to believe that those are signs of danger right. and kind of pretend that they're still in the script when yeah. the bad guy has already taken action to, to change the story. Sure. Yeah, we, we try to rationalize danger. Mm -hmm. you know, we try to rationalize the presence of a threat. And we're the only animal on the planet that does that. You know, you scare a dog or a cat. They don't stand there looking at you and think, you know, okay, why is this guy doing this? You know, no, no they, they get the hell out of there. Like they're afraid mm -hmm. and they run, they get out of there where we'll look danger right in the face and we'll try to rationalize that. You know, why is it here? Why is this happening to me? Why is, you know, why me? Why out of all these people, you know? And we start asking these questions and trying to come up with these little excuses in our head when really 
it's all about just listening to that initial intuition, knowing what you're looking for in terms of situational awareness, what you need to avoid, and then what your options are for that avoidance. Absolutely. And that kind of moves on to the second part of the book, which you call build your situational awareness. Yeah. And I feel like often, you know, building situational awareness is important, but in so many cases, I think it's more accurate to say that we need to respect our situational awareness because we have it. We were born with those little things we pick up that we use in other situations. You know, we are the product of millions of years of developing being smart in situations sure. of not being eaten by that lion of the Serengeti. You know, we, we got here on the backs of so much evolution right. or however you want to do, however you want to describe that. But building and respecting your situational awareness is a skill because when we are born with the ability to pay attention, to act on our instincts and respect our intuition. And it seems like life from the second you start school until kind of your mid twenties is just this giant festival of teaching you not to do that. Right. <laughs> right uh so how do we learn to rebuild those skills and to respect that awareness and make it a part of our daily life well the the first thing you have to understand is like you said in terms of evolution mm -hmm. you know situational awareness is hardwired into us but we call it mm -hmm. intuition so the process of situational awareness is, is a cognitive process it's something that we actually have to take the time to think about but you know, there are certain things in our environment that, that, that we see, you know, or we hear, or there are certain things that we just pick up on that overrides that cognitive process and instantly sends that kind of adrenaline dump into our system. So, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, your hair standing up on end, or I got the, you know, I was around this guy and I got the chills or I just got this gut feeling that something wasn't right when I walked into that building. You know, all that is, there's a reason that you have that feeling. And don't try to rationalize it like we just talked about earlier, because there's some something in your DNA, there's something in your mind that, that, that keyed you into something is wrong and is feeding you those signals, is bypassing that cognitive process and feeding you those signals to get you out of there. So... Listen to your intuition always. That's the first step. Mm. After that, it's basically just learning the nuts and bolts, what I call the nuts and bolts of situational awareness and how they work together. And that comes down to like the Cooper's colors, the different levels of situational awareness and where you should be at any given time. Uh, the OODA loop, you know, observe, orient, decide, and act. And I feel like a lot of times you th these things get overused, like you hear about them so much, you're like, oh, geez, you know, the, the OODA loop again. But it, it's there, you know, it's no different than our intuition. It's a process and it's a process that we can't avoid. So, you know, no matter what you call it, you know, you can give it a fancy new acronym or whatever, but it's all the same. It's all just nuts and bolts, you know. The other one is the reactionary gap. So understanding how when something happens, it triggers that OODA loop and how through you know, through situational awareness and being able to spot something ahead of time decreases that re or increases the reactionary gap, yeah, I should say, so that you have more time to react to something. Because, you know, if you shut yourself off from your environment, I, I use this as an example. I just wrote this down, I think, in the, in the third book, which just got submitted to the publishers. But imagine it this way. You're driving down the road, you know, you're four or five car links behind the car in front of you, you see brake lights, you know, three cars in front of them. And it kind of has a snowball effect. You see it coming. So you start easing up on your brakes and you come to a slow stop about two car links behind the car in front of you. That's, that's just good driving. That's good situation. Where is you're paying attention to what's going on right now? Imagine you're trying to, you see it all the time, people on their phones while they're driving, you know, they got a text and they're so absorbed into that that they're failing to notice what's going on around them. So now when those brake lights start cascading towards them, you know, they look up, the vehicle in front of them is at a dead stop and they don't have that time that they need to react to that. They didn't give themselves that buffer that they needed. So that's how those nuts and bolts of situational awareness kind of all tie together. You know, one, make sure you are paying attention but doing so in a way that's not stressing you out. We call that condition yellow. You're just alert and observant and relaxed. 
aside from that, you think about the OODA loop, you know, and you play those little what if games with yourself so that you can anticipate actions of other people's. You can anticipate how they may react in certain situations. And then, you know, the, the avoidance piece. So that's it. And the OODA loop for uh, viewers who aren't familiar with it, it's observe, orient, decide, and yeah. then act. Yep. And it's basically something happens, you figure out what's going on, you decide what to do about it, and then you do it. Yeah. And your, your, your classic blitz attack uh, takes advantage of that by you get that first punch in the, in the back of the head. And by the time you figured out you're, you've been punched in the head and maybe decide what to do about it, they've then kicked you in the groin. Right resetting the OODA loop and so you never get a chance to get to that decide and act part of it because they keep resetting it with each hit right and the way to avoid that is to have your first indication of trouble not be being punched in the head right. but that sketchy person coming within arm's reach of you or approaching you from across the street yeah yeah exactly so, if you can see if you can see it coming you have a much better chance of defending yourself yeah. you know like we said earlier your best chance is always going to be avoidance. Mm -hmm. If you can't avoid something, then it's going to be escape. You know, like it's happening around me. How the hell do I get out of it? And then after that, it's de-escalation. If you can't escape it, there's no way out. You have your communication skills. You can always try to de-escalate or there's confrontation. You know, those are your only four options when it comes to, mm -hmm. when it comes to this. Now there's a lot of different little aspects within each one of those but those are basically it. So avoidance is always the best. The closer you get to confrontation, the more the chances are that you're just going to get yourself hurt. Absolutely. One of the, one of the things that's happened in my life since starting this show is it's very difficult for me to watch action movies on TV <laughs> or TV shows. With, like we were watching a show last night where some, a woman got kidnapped by her stalker ex-husband. And you, know, you don't want to victim blame, but so many times you go, you could have gotten out of that. You could have gotten out of that could have avoided yeah. that why aren't yeah. you escaping what <laughs> yeah yeah and that I, that it can actually be a not bad safe drill yeah. for families you know, you're just watching tv watch the person get in trouble think okay how far back could i have just gotten in the car and gone home right, right. exactly you know? yeah and that kind of brings us to number three which is developing personal defenses as part of this awareness situation could you talk to us a bit about that yeah. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different parts of developing your personal defenses. Mm -hmm. And that can be from taking, you know, firearms classes to jujitsu classes mm -hmm. to, you know, just hitting the gym and keeping yourself fit so that you could fight yeah. if the need arose, or at least keep yourself in the fight long enough for somebody to respond yeah. to it that can help you out. So not to mention that that's going to protect you from the five biggest killers of adults in North America, which is, uh, you know, heart disease, yeah. diabetes you know all the things that are really going to kill people our age at our point yeah yeah absolutely. going to the gym is going to protect us from those yeah yeah it's, you know it's funny because uh you talk yeah. about the things that can kill you now you know yeah. the things that can kill me right now are much different than the things that could kill me when i was in my 20s you yeah know? and and I, I used to and i still do you know i've got all these first aid kits with tourniquets and you know the you know, the galls and everything. And I keep them in my range bag and I keep them in my truck and I keep them in all these different places. Well, since I bought a farm here in Virginia and I retired from the air marshal service, I moved back home to Virginia. I quickly realized when I started clearing some of this land that I may need a tourniquet when I'm out in this field with my chainsaw. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, these are the things that are popping into my mind now because I'm more likely to be killed by my own chainsaw <laughs> than I am in a gunfight at 30,000 feet in the air now. So, yeah. you know, the, the way you prepare yourself and the way you mm. place yourself, you know, in terms of your equipment and stuff like that all changes with mm. time and it changes with mm. your, with your environment as well. That's why mm. when I talk about, you know, building your personal defenses in the book, you know, don't, don't pigeonhole yourself into just one thing, you know, just changing, building your personal defenses can range anywhere from just changing your posture and your body language. When you walk down the street, putting your phone in your pocket, taking the headphones out and just listening to the things that are going on around you and, you know, going to some high speed three day gun course because you, you know, you carry concealed. There's a wide range of things you can do. But to think that because you carry a gun 
or because you're a knife guy or because you're a black belt in jujitsu that you've got this thing licked and you know, you know how to take care of yourself. You know how to take care of yourself in a certain situation, given a certain set of circumstances, you know, and without that situational awareness piece, you know, all that's null and void. All that money you paid for firearms classes and training or jujitsu courses or whatever, you know, goes right down the toilet. And you'll, you know, a lot of people second guess themselves after a violent encounter, you know, like, what was I thinking? Why did I spend so much time on this when I should have been looking at that, you know, and then people have a tendency to shift focus and okay, now this is my thing. This is what I'm getting into, you know, and then they, then something else falls off being really prepared for dangerous situations, you know, all starts up here in your mind. You know, we, we tell people all the time in the academy when I work for as an instructor for the air marshal service that your body's not going to go where your mind hasn't been. And that's kind of the theme of that third section in the book. You have to play those little what if games that we talked about. You have to be able to visualize things that could go wrong. And, and how would you counter that? It's, you know, it's funny. I, I started off when the book was first published. I couldn't wait to read the reviews and stuff on Amazon and online and everything. And, and, and they're very good. It's like 4.8 out of five, you know, on Amazon, like 110 reviews. But, you know, there's a couple that are like, yeah, this is, you know, mm. a lot of people think that you're just walking around expecting the worst, mm. you know, and, and one person that wrote a review is like, well, that's no way to live. I don't want to live that way. Well, that's fine. I don't walk around expecting the worst. That's not what this is about. What I do is I walk around with my head up with a realistic approach to the fact that there are bad people in the world. You know, I spent my whole life trying to fight these people <laughs> and yeah. you know, they, they do want to do things to you for no apparent reason. So if I can do something little like get my head out of my cell phone, you know, take the earbuds out, just pay attention to my surroundings or, you know, play those little games in my head. Like, man, what if something happened right here? This is a bad, like you get those feelings like this is a bad situation. What would I do right now if this happened or if that happened? You know, that's not living in a, that's making you more in tune with your environment. That's not yeah. living in a, in a, in a doom and gloom type mindset. That's just keeping yourself prepared. And, Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I feel like, I mean, we both know that tactical guy who is living in a paranoid mindset, but that's not oh, what sure. it be. Yeah. But I think, you know, if you were curious and mindful, that's situational awareness. And we right. not only spot the bad guy coming, we see the gorgeous sunset and the hummingbird and the flower. Yeah. You know, exactly. we see our kid, that moment our kid has with our dog. Yeah. It's, it's and, relaxed awareness, you know, yeah. and that's, that's what we talk about when we talk about those conditions of awareness, mm -hmm. that condition yellow, condition white. Mm -hmm. And this is where I started working with my kids on it. Uh, mm -hmm. I tell a story in my book about someone targeted my children and tried, tried to take them out of school. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a scary situation for us. And the kids realized right away that something is wrong, like something that has something to do with daddy's job all of a sudden spilled over into our personal life and now things are dangerous for us. So when I started talking to them about situational awareness, it became a whole lot easier for them, you know, to buy into this. So it's, uh, you know, when you're working with your children and things like that, it's easy for them to always find themselves in that condition white. And when I catch my kids, like, you know, like at the mall or something, they're just completely walking and sucked into their cell phone. I just snatch your cell phone from them. And then you see the head start spinning. Like, what are, what are you doing? You know, you know, you don't let yourself be in condition. You're in condition white right now. Just don't be in condition white. And daddy won't take your cell phone. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, if you weren't paying enough attention to stop me from taking your cell phone, the yeah. cell phone's clearly a problem right now. Yeah, then it's going to be a problem. Yeah. So, you know, I started yeah. doing those. I used to call them sneak attacks on my kids. <laughs> And, and it kind of opened their eyes. They got so paranoid when I would walk into the room that they would actually start watching each other's back. Like, hey, you're dad, you know, make sure your phone goes <laughs> away. You know? And I told them, you know, that's, that's how you should be all the time. Not all the time. You want to be able to let yourself down, you know, let yourself kind of yeah. rest and be in condition white. But you want that a little. I, I learned about condition white at a, an event down in Los Angeles. It was a, one of Paul Funyak's, you know, three day camps. And there were about a okay. hundred people there. And I'd been training for 27 years at that point. I, I feel, figured I could handle myself, but there was a, there were guys from the DOD there. There were a couple of Navy SEALs. There were just a ton of cops. Yeah. You know, there I was surrounded by, you know, about a hundred, 
a hundred of the most dangerous good guys on the planet. I'm like, I get to be in condition white right now. My kids were with my parents. You know? yeah. I get to, I get to be condition white right now because it's if anything happens, that's not my job. There are right. better people for the job. Yeah. But when you're not in that kind of level of safety, you know, you did, that relaxed awareness, that curiosity, that mindfulness. And by the way, the people who recommend that kind of mindset aren't just folks like you and Rory, but it's Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama also recommend maintaining a relaxed conscious mindful curious state of awareness yeah you know yeah, there's, something, there's something there mm -hmm. you know and I, yeah. you know I, I write it all off to you know technology is a good thing you, can't, you know mm -hmm. it's a, i'm not that old guy i'm not you know the dude's getting old <laughs> like back in my day you know we didn't you know kind of thing but yeah. it's, uh you know it has its ups and downs and mm -hmm. it creates to me you know what, what we call in the book focus lock and if there's one thing in your environment that is so enticing that you can't take your eyes off of it, you know, and it negates everything else going on around you, then that thing is a problem, you know, and you need to get rid of it. So, you know, the biggest thing that I see, I used to see this all the time when I worked as a federal air marshal, you know, you're walking through the airports, I've seen people fall down escalators, you know, I've seen people walk into glass doors, be completely separated from their, you know, from their party, all because they're just so sucked into that cell phone, you know, that they can't pay attention to anything else going on around them. So, you know, the more you divide your focus, the more you're taking away from the things that are important and the things that you should be paying attention to, especially when you're out in public. So, you know, the focus lock thing is a big one. If you catch yourself focusing on something and it doesn't have to be the cell phone that that you you almost have an inability a lot of people call it zoning out but you're mm -hmm. focusing on something whether it's in your mind or it's a physical object that's taking away from everything else so when you catch yourself doing that try to you know snap yourself out of it take a look around because when you notice that there's a problem if there's someone in the area that 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 has those predatory you know that predatory mindset i guarantee they've already noticed that you weren't paying attention by the time you notice that you're not paying attention, you could very well be getting attacked. So make sure, you know, that you're not giving them that, that head start. Yeah, by keeping that awareness that gives you a buffer zone, as you say, around so that it'll, you see it coming along. Now Mr. you mentioned specifically playing what if games, which I think is a great concept. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so, you know, the what if game is just, you know, you're no matter what situation you find yourself in, you're just asking yourself little questions. And I used to play this stuff all the time with my kids. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, what if we're in a, you know, when my kids were young, what if we're out in a crowd and you become separated? You know, this is one of the things I talk about in the next book that's coming out, Spotting Danger Before It mm -hmm. Spots Your Kids. My wife had always taught my children. We, we stayed away from the whole stranger danger thing mm -hmm. because it could very well be a stranger that your child has to rely on to keep them safe at a certain point. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we always used to teach our kids, you know, there's no stranger danger thing. You know, you should be more alert and aware when you're around people you don't know, but you need to know what to look for and who to approach if you become mm -hmm. separated. So that what if game was, you know, with my kids was, you know, what if we were separated right now in this area, who would you look to for help and why, you know? Mm -hmm. And what my wife always taught my kids was look for a mother. You know, mm -hmm. look for a mother because whether we like it or not, and I don't mean this to be sexist or anything like that, but, you know, men are the ones that are doing most of the damage when it comes mm -hmm. to, when it comes to violence and women are the protectors, especially when it comes to mm -hmm. children. So if, you know, if your kid becomes separated from you and they can find somebody that looks like a mother, they have children of their own, mm -hmm. they just increase their chances of that person mm -hmm. you know, being empathetic towards their situation. Hey, I'll, I'm separated from my yeah. mom and dad. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'll, they'll help out. And I tell that story in the book too, because it happened. I used to live in Las Vegas when I first started with the federal air marshal service, my son was around 12 years old and he was getting into sports and he wanted to run a 5k at the time I was running, you know, distance races and stuff, you know, marathons, half marathons and whatnot, but he wanted to run a 5k. So we signed up together. We're going to run the Susan G. Coleman 5k, you know, the breast cancer runs. Mm -hmm. And 
we were all excited. We had our race shirts and everything put together. We'd raised a little bit of money and, you know, all this different stuff. So he's so excited. We get there and we're in this huge crowd right off of Fremont street. I don't know if you're familiar with Las Vegas, but Fremont street is the old part of Las Vegas. It's got this lit up covered canopy over it. and everybody was packed under there. And it was so crowded that I turned my back for a split second. My son was gone. So instantly I start thinking, okay, I'm looking for this little redheaded kid. You know, he should be easy enough to find, but he wasn't because he's wearing the same race shirt that thousands of other people are wearing. He just blended into his surroundings. I saw some cops. I knew they had radios and there was plenty of them around Fremont Street. So I'm like, all right, we can cordon this off if we can start some communication chain. And I went over to a cop and I was getting ready to start talking to the cop and identifying my child and describing him. And I look up and I see my kid walking up the steps to where they make the announcement for the start. And he's with Ronald McDonald, right? <laughs> Yeah. Ronald McDonald and this lady in a big flowery dress mm -hmm. and I'm like I see it and they're only maybe 20 30 yards away from me and I'm yelling yeah. oh hey hey that's my boy Josh and he sees me and he waves and then he talks to Ronald McDonald you know and, <laughs> and the lady and they they verify mm -hmm. okay that's his dad so instead of making the announcement they come down to get me and uh it was it was so surreal mm -hmm. my kid yeah. was Ronald McDonald. and uh I'm like, man, what happened? He's like, I don't know. I turned around and you were gone. He said, but I found this lady who had two kids with her and she looked like a mom and mm -hmm. she took me to Ronald McDonald and Ronald McDonald was going to make the announcement that I lost my dad. <laughs> it just kind of went from there. But you know, even Ronald yeah. McDonald mm -hmm. complimented my kid on how smart he was and how well he reacted to that situation. So I put that story in the second book. It's kind of funny. No, that's, a, that's a great story. And it's exactly right. You know, that's that idea of when I ran, I ran a martial arts school for about 10 years. And with the kids classes, when we did that topic, we'd have them say, well, if you can't find your mom, find someone else's mom. Sure. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's that that's because that person, you know, as you say, the men are doing most of the damage. So you've already improved it. And also a mother faced with a lost child will stop at nothing short of endangering her own children to reunite that child with his parents. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there's now, a, um, you know, there, there's, there's a, there's a serious biological draw there, you know, yeah. that they want to see this child safe. That's all there is to it. Yeah. And, you know, no matter what causes that, that's their best bet. But, you know, had we not played those what if games yeah. you know, with our children, this has happened to pretty much every one of my children. Not that I lose my children all the time, <laughs> Well, in, in different circumstances, different scenarios, you know, whether they were nine years old or 19 years old, those what if games, every one of my children have came back and told me, you know, that that's what I was thinking about when I did this, because I was thinking about those what if games we used to play. And I'm like, wow, I've been in this scenario before because dad talked me through it. And whether it's just mentally walking yourself through a situation or physically living through it you know, those do something to your reactionary times. And mm -hmm. when it comes, when you come under stress and you have to react to something, if your body or your mind has seen this before, it'll react more appropriately than it would if you were just caught off guard by something. Yeah. Uh, you, we were talking about developing personal defenses. And I honestly think that that is one of the biggest advantages of getting some training, whether you're going to jujitsu class or traditional karate or getting on the range. But I've never talked to a martial artist who use their skills defensively the way it was taught in the dojo. Right. You know, they did, you didn't go, ha, 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 ha. You more like yeah. grab the guy, throw him against the wall, knead him a couple of times. Yeah. You know, but what the training really does is it gets you in the mindset of playing those what if games for physical scenarios yeah. or if a guy throws a punch like this okay you're going to come in here you're going to blade out and you think about it so that you're not frozen for options and then just expanding right. that out into more situational things from yeah. getting lost to seeing somebody coming or these days going up to the uber and getting being really sketched out by the driver you know yeah, all of those yeah. things yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because I think back when I first started, I got out of the military and I first started working for the Bureau of Prisons in 1995. And they send you down to Glencoe, Georgia, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center down there for this three week course. Now they're getting ready to throw you to the wolves with these inmates, you know, and on the evening watch, they lock you into a housing unit with 129 of them. And it's just you. 
right? And, and you get this three weeks of training. So <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I responded to a body alarm, which is where someone's in a fight, you know, they're under duress or inmates are, are fighting or whatever. They hit the body alarm, control announces where that's taking place. And everybody responds to it. So for my three weeks of training in Glencoe, Georgia, I had been, uh, I had been uh, just, you know, drilled into me with the, uh, uh, what's it, uh, keto, right? Like the little joint locks and, and mm. stuff like that. And that's what we learned, these little pressure points and the keto and all this different stuff. And I got this in my mind and I'm, I'm running towards this body alarm and I'm like, all right, I got this. And like, this is going to be awesome. My first, you know, my first response to something. And we get there and there's like four inmates going at it. And, you know, a couple of them are about 225 pounds and they're all pissed off. And I realized in the first two seconds that I jumped into that mess, that that wrist lock that I learned in that three weeks of training is not suitable for this situation. You know, as a matter of fact, I didn't find it suitable for any situation that I ended up in working for the Bureau of Prisons. So you learn really quick that, you know, just because you train a certain way and you're really good at a certain thing doesn't prepare you necessarily for every circumstance. So the more well-rounded you can make yourself, whether it comes to, you know, the fine motor skills necessary to, to do uh, an intricate joint lock or, you know, the gross motor skills of just throwing a haymaker at somebody, you know, you got to, you, know, you got to train in all those different aspects to make yourself as well-rounded as you possibly can be. And that all just comes into play and becomes useful if you get to that confrontation piece of the puzzle. You know, you back up a couple steps from that and you work on your, you know, your, your, your communication skills, you work on your situational awareness. Hopefully it never gets to that point in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, and what I've if games work there too, right? What's that? What if, what if games work there as well, where you play the what if there's yeah. somebody loitering by my car as I come out of the restaurant at, one, at 10 o'clock at night. Right. What if there's somebody walking down the street toward me that I'm not, not feeling right about? What if, you know, talk to your, talk to your daughter or your son. What if you're on a date and the person's giving off all the wrong signals? Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that you got to think about. And, you know, I started thinking about this book deal and putting all this stuff on paper, the situational awareness mm -hmm. piece. And the first time I wrote it all out, I'm just, my mind is trying to spread out into all these different categories. And that's when my publisher mm -hmm. came and said, listen, so we want this to be a series of books because people, you can't just, mm -hmm. you know, it's like watering somebody through a, through a fire hose. It's just too much, too fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we did was we wrote the first book, Spotting Danger Before It Spots You. And that's, mm -hmm the general situational awareness. That's what everybody- This will come out the week that, this will come out this week, the week that this uh No, this no, this, this, this is out now. This one's out? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, this one's yeah, out this already. Out now, this book's been out for okay. a year. So you oh, okay, great. Anywhere, yeah, you can get it anywhere books are sold. You can get it Absolutely. at Amazon, you, mm -hmm. Barnes and Noble, Books A Million, Target, Walmart, you can get it all those mm -hmm. places. The second book coming out, uh, the ebook comes out in May, on May the oh, 1st. Okay. And the paperback comes out June the 1st. And that's spotting danger before it spots your kids. So like I was saying, the publisher wanted to break it down incrementally. So I figured the best place to start was give everybody kind of the general overview of situational awareness and how it works. That's what this book is. The second book is for parents or any adult really that has a, a child in their life, a niece, a nephew, if you're a teacher and you work with children. It, it's not about setting the child down and talking to them right now about all the dangers in the world that they're going to face. Cause I'm a big advocate for not teaching through fear. You know, I want my kids to be confident and assertive. I don't want them to be fearful and situational awareness helps with that. Now that first book for children, this spotting danger before it spots your kids is for kids between the ages of say, you know, five and 12. And you're not necessarily setting them down and talking to them, like I said, about all the dangerous things they're going to you know, encounter. All you're doing is giving them the tools they need to build their situational awareness in the future. And you can do that through simple little games, you know, games that strengthen the cognitive process, critical thinking, uh, memory, something that builds their descriptive vocabulary. You know, and you're teaching them little things like, 
Like what's mommy and daddy's first and last names? My wife used to work in a hospital as a nurse. And, you know, she used to say all the time, she'd talk to kids like, what's your daddy's name? Daddy. You know, what's your mommy's name? Mommy. <laughs> you know, they, a lot of parents, they take these things for granted you know, that your child could be separated from you or have to answer questions from somebody. And they may not always have those answers. So teaching them how to memorize a phone number or an address, mm -hmm. you know, teaching them mommy and daddy's first name, where they work, you know, things like that, just basic information. Then when they get to their teenage years and they can combine those little skills they learn as younger children with the stuff that's in the first book. And now you've got a situational awareness program that you can kind of talk to your teens about. But unlike in the first book, you know, the, the third one that's going to come out that's going to be for teens deals with, you know, the things that you mentioned earlier, like dating, you know, getting your first job uh, when you start driving you know, going on school trips, playing team sports, all these different things, you know, where, where people can take advantage of children, you know, whether they're yeah. 18 years old or eight years old, and they need to understand, depending on what age group they're in, what they're looking for and what it is they're trying to accomplish to keep themselves safe. So that's, that's what those books are all for. Excellent. And again, Spotting Danger Before Spots You is out now. And yes. I think that Gene must have been talking about spotting danger before it spots your kids. Yes. Uh, when he when he approached me, and that will be out by the time this episode drops. I think. It, it, so, like I said, the ebook comes out May the first, yep. and June the first is the paperback. So excellent. So, you know, we got a lot of good feedback mm -hmm. on that one so far, and good. like I said, I, I, I'm, you know, when it comes to teaching your kids about things, I don't want to teach my kids to be afraid. And that used to be one of the things that I had a friend of mine when I was a federal air marshal and he was a uniformed cop in Las Vegas for a long time. And you see it a lot, you know, not just him telling this story to me, but you see it when you're out and about on your own, you know, the parent in, in Walmart or wherever that's got an unruly kid and there's a cop there and the parent says, well, if you're not good, I'm going to have this cop arrest you. You know, and that's, that's no, you know, what are you teaching your child there? You know, and it's the same thing with strangers, not just police officers, but strangers, you know, mm -hmm. don't teach them yeah. to look for, you know, don't teach them to be afraid of strangers or be afraid of mm -hmm. police officers, teach them to be afraid of certain actions that people take that could pose a threat yeah. to their safety. But when it comes to fear in children, you know, a little bit of fear is kind of a good thing because it keeps them sharp and it keeps them on their toes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. You know, you got to teach them how to manage that as well mm -hmm. and what it does to them and how they can counter those effects mm -hmm. and the things that they should be looking for, depending on their age group to help them manage their own safety. Mm -hmm. You know, as a parent, you are 100 percent responsible for the safety of your child. That's all there is to it. But you can give them the tools they need to participate in mm -hmm. their, you know, in their personal safety. And that's what those and and they like to know, even the youngest ones like to participate and like to be helpful. And oh, I, like the, I like what you're saying about how they don't teach them fear, teach them solutions, age appropriate solutions, yeah. ways yeah. that they can deal with, can solve it. And you, you, know, you make you, it fun for them too. You know, yeah. like we used to play a game with my kids all the time, you know, drive, drive us home. They didn't get behind mm. the wheel to drive, but you know, when they were old enough to look out the windows and know where they were going, you know, you'd say, okay, I'm at an intersection. How do I get us home? Do I turn left or do I turn right? And make them memorize. And it's a game. Mm -hmm. you know, just make it a yeah. game. You know, you reward the right answers. So, you know, if you, if you could get me all the way home and tell me where a police station was or where a hospital was or where a firehouse was, then, you know, maybe after dinner we go to ice cream. So, you know, make it fun for them and give them those little skills that they need mm -hmm. to kind of have them interacting with their environment. You know, that's the important part. That's the key is get them to, to interacting with the things that are happening around them so that they can identify and interpret those environmental cues, you know, that, that point towards dangerous situations and then teach them how to, you know, avoid that. And if they can't, then how to alert an adult and the proper adult, you know, to the situation. And that's, not just good advice to teach our kids, but uh, remember to teach ourselves. Sure. Because <laughs> a lot of, we're running around not interacting with our environments as much as we probably should on a re fairly regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. See it all the time. Yeah. 
So thank you so much for coming on the show today, Gary. Uh, before we go, what is a question that you haven't been asked enough? Something that you would like to talk about more, but people don't give you the opportunity. Oh, well, that, that's a pretty good question. So, and, and that's why I wrote books because I can put it all down there. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, one thing that people, you know, we talk about the levels of situational awareness, Cooper's colors and all this stuff. There's a thing that I came up with and, and I outlined it in the book. And this is my own acronym, right? It's, it, and it's PROD. So this is one of the things that I like to talk about when it comes to spotting danger. And we talk about predatory mindset. So, you know, we mentioned Ted Bundy and how quickly a predator, you know, the Grayson and Stein study and how quickly a predator can pick up on these little indicators that you are a soft target. So what specifically are they looking for? And I break that down into what I call the seven second prod. So it takes them seven seconds to identify a soft target and come up with a plan to attack that target, seven seconds. So what they're looking for and the acronym prod is the P stands for perception. And then there's risk, observable value and defenses, right? So those things, those are what you have to perform kind of a self-assessment using this template, this prod template. So when you go out in public, what is the perception that people have of you, right? Do you look like a soft target or a hard target? And the way you determine that is by, you know, thinking about the things we outline in the book and the things that the inmates gave us information about in that Grayson and Stein study. Am I standing up straight? Am I walking like I have a purpose? Am I making eye contact and not getting focus locked on my phone or something else around me? So that perception can mean the difference between you being attacked or being passed by. The next one is risk. How much risk do you pose to a predator? Do you look like somebody that can take care of themselves? You know, are you paying attention to your surroundings? Because we talked about it earlier, they're more concerned with their own personal safety than they are getting away with a crime. So that's why they always go for the softest targets. Do you look like the type of person that would raise an alarm or draw attention to the situation, right? That's the risk observable value is the things that you have on you that may make the risk worth it because of the reward. So a fancy watch, a Louis Vuitton purse, an expensive, you know, laptop backpack that they can pretty much guess there's an expensive laptop in, you know, even all the way down to your shoes, anything of excessive value that you can eliminate will be in your benefit because it makes you less of a likely target. And then defenses is the last piece. If you're going to be out in public, you know, do all the things you're supposed to do in terms of paying attention. But if you can be in a group with friends, that makes you a harder target. It makes you more defensible. If you've got a dog, whether it's a small dog or a big dog, that makes you less likely to be approached by a stranger or somebody that's looking to do you harm. So that right there, I think, is the one thing I don't get asked enough about. But I could talk about it you know, ad nauseum, the whole prod piece of what it means and how it affects your personal safety and the things you can do to eliminate some of those things to make yourself that, that harder target. Yeah, that's a very good checklist. Just walking through the things that people observe, you know, yeah. they're yeah, and, where, in this and, uh, book, there's actually a self-assessment that you can do in the back of the book where yeah. you kind of break all those things down and then you can start making some changes to, you know, to, to yourself, to put yourself more in line with the things that predators aren't looking for, the things they want to stay away from. Yeah, because again, you can be a stone badass like Gary and not have a 0% chance of dying if you get into a physical altercation. And even if the whole thing goes very well, there's criminal charges that sure. might be levied against you or a civil suit. And just the mental and emotional pain of having harmed another human being. Right. Where if you see the trouble coming and you get in your car and drive away or walk into a crowded store and hang out there until the person wanders off or whatever, yeah. you have a 0% chance of dying from that encounter or having your life irrevocably changed. Right. So it's just I good sense. All the time, you know, the, the, the you, you run into it a lot, you know, in different training venues and in different aspects of your life when you run in some of the circles that we run in. 
you know, the person that's like, you know, this would never happen to me because I, you know, I carry this or, you know, I'm a black belt in that, or, you know, I worked here for X amount of years, you know, for the agency or what, you know, whatever. And, you know, those people are just as susceptible to these things as, mm-hmm. as anybody else walking down the street, you know? So it's the people that, that, that I think talk the most about fighting and violence mm-hmm. that, and how they would handle it. You know, if, if you've ever had to handle it in your life, then you know that you want to avoid it. Getting your ass kicked hurts, you know, and it's not something yeah. you want to continue to do. And, and yeah. if you can avoid that, you will. And mm-hmm. if you've been exposed to real violence for any, any period of time, whether it be briefly or as part of a career, you know, you kind of go out of your way eventually, mm-hmm. especially now, like me, you know, I'm 50 <laughs> years old, you know, I've got a certain, not, not to be like, yeah. Liam, yeah. but I've got a yeah. set of skills. <laughs> but those skills, you know, are, are, you know, they degrade over time. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm not in that game all the time, you know, I've got to try to stay on top of things to keep myself sharp. The average person just doesn't do that. And talking about it yeah. isn't enough. You know, you got to educate mm-hmm. You got to get out there and actually do the work, you know, and try to broaden your horizons and not get locked into one particular thing that you think may save your life. You've got a whole giant bookshelf there behind you, you know, with so much information packed into it about personal safety that, you know, you stand a pretty good chance of just being able to spot something ahead of time and work yourself around it and avoid the fight altogether. Because it's not, it's not a position you want to be in. You don't go out. If you know how to handle trouble, you don't go out looking for it. You know, you try to find ways. Yeah. To get Especially as a parent, you know, because then we're not just gambling with our own health and welfare, but we're gambling with literally the entirety of our children's lives. Right. Well, after we would have naturally died because of our absence that we're risking when we get into it. Yeah. So thank you so much, Gary, for coming on today. Appreciate it. Folks, do pick up the book. It's really worth your time. And I don't, I don't say those kinds of things lightly. So thank you so much. Hey, no problem. It's my pleasure. Look, uh, look forward to uh, listening to this again when it comes out. <laughs> Excellent. All right, man. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. All right, bud. Bye. Thank you for watching today. I hope you found something useful or maybe even inspiring. If you liked what you saw, please take a few minutes to subscribe, like, and comment. Those little things add up to big help for the channel. If you loved it, consider checking out our Facebook page for more family safety news and information. And think about supporting us on Patreon, where you'll get early access, monthly training resources, blooper footage, and other exclusive benefits. You'll find links to both in the show notes. Most of all, thank you for being part of the Safest Family on the Block team. Stay safe, everybody. See you next time.